Welcome to the HR Chat Show, one of the world's most downloaded and shared podcasts designed for HR pros, talent execs, tech enthusiasts, and business leaders. For hundreds more episodes and what's new in the world of work, subscribe to the show, follow us on social media, and visit hrgazette.com. The HR Chat Show has hit another big milestone, listeners. We've reached episode 600. Hello, this is Bill Bannum. To celebrate the big 600, I wanted to highlight the work done by two very well-known industry figures who I personally have huge amounts of respect for. I'm delighted, therefore, to offer a very special episode featuring exclusive clips from recent conversations that I had with two of the biggest names in the world of work, Dave Ulrich and Josh Burson. Listen as we discuss what motivates them to continue to contribute to the HR space, what Josh and Dave would hope that their world of work legacies will be, their perceptions of how the concept of employee experience has shifted over the last decade, and their take on how generative AI and deep language models will shake up the HR function and employee experience in the coming years. We couldn't have got to episode 600, of course, without the continued and humbling support of you, our amazing audience. We love and appreciate you. Thank you. I hope you enjoy this very special episode featuring two of the biggest names in the world of HR. Thanks for tuning in to the HR Chat Podcast. If you're enjoying this episode, We'd really appreciate it if you could subscribe and leave a five-star review on your podcast platform of choice. And now, back to the conversation. You are, of course, one of the most successful, respected, and well-known voices in the world of work. Uh, you, you've probably received every accolade that exists. What motivates you to continue to contribute to the HR space? It's a great question. My wife often asks me that question. Why are we still doing this? And the answer for me is this is not a job. I was in a meeting the other day and people were introducing themselves. I work for this company. I work for this company. I do this job. And I introduced myself in a funny way. My company is the HR profession. And my job is to create ideas and frameworks that move that profession forward. I have a variety of perches. I'm perched at the University of Michigan. I'm perched in the RBL group. But my calling, not just a job, is to create ideas with impact that move the HR, not just the HR profession, but that move people and organization forward. And so I define this more as a calling. Why would I retire? I love what I do. And uh, I believe this this position, this calling is going to continue for as long as I'm able. You know, I stumbled into this mid-career and found it to be the most gratifying thing I've ever done in my career. And what keeps me excited about it day after day, month after month, is the constantly changing environment, issues, technology, culture, economy that affect work, that affect employees, that affect management, that affect HR, that it's, it's like this massive puzzle that's always interesting to un, unlock. And being sort of a scientist by nature, I just get a thrill out of it. And then, of course, the people in HR are the nicest, most generous, most hardworking people I've ever worked with and other parts of my career included. So I get constant, you know, gratification about the people I work with. And then the value, you know, that you can provide in this domain is so high. I mean, there's so many things that can be fixed and improved in every company Um, It's not hard to find things that we can do better. So all of those things keep me doing this. What would you hope that your legacy will be in the world of work? When people talk about you in 25, 30, 50 years time, what what would you hope that legacy would be? You know, it's interesting to look back at the icons in our field, the the people like a Jay Galbraith, a Peter Drucker, Warren Bennis. What's their legacy? They gave people a way to think about their organization and how work gets done in their organization that gave them a more fulfilling life. I hope I can begin to create with so many great colleagues and you've interviewed all of them. How do you think about organizations in a way that helps that organizational setting create a way of life that allow people to prosper and thrive? 
And to do that, I think we have ideas that change the way we think about HR. We'll talk about those, obviously. But for me, ultimately, the goal is to change the way we think about work and organizations so that people thrive. They have a better experience, both at work and at home. I know that sounds a little utopian and ambitious, but I really believe that organizations are one of the most critical settings in the world where people get their needs met because the organization succeeds in their marketplace. Wow. Well, I don't think about that very much. Um, I suppose um, I'm not really looking for fame here, uh, but I suppose I would like to be remembered when, whenever I retire as someone who brought a lot of new ideas and a lot of creative thinking to this domain and added a lot of value to a lot of companies and to a lot of individuals. I, I think as I get a little bit older, I get more turned on by helping each individual HR professional and leader in their own career, um, as well as helping companies. So um, that, that would be fine. That would be enough. I'd like to talk a little bit about employee experience with you. In your opinion, how's the concept of employee experience shifted in the last, say, 10 years? You know, one of the things I love love to do, Bill, and, and you're a part of that with your incredible HR chat and other podcasts. I love to build on the past. Sometimes I get frustrated that people come out and say, here's a brand new idea. We should engage people. And I'm going, give me a break. Here's a brand new idea. There is an evolution of thinking. And if we build on the past, we make the future better. So around the employee experience, we've talked before about motivation, satisfaction, engagement, commitment, experience. So as you build on each of those areas, what's next? And when, when I begin to look at organizations as an observer and people, the word personalization really comes to mind with two parts. Part one is personal. Let's build on the employee experience and really demonstrate a sense of whatever you want to call it, the C words, compassion, care, concern, or the E words, empathy, emotion. We care about you as an individual person. We will tailor the work to you. And we'll discover what gives you a great experience at work. It isn't a generic proposition. It's a tailored experience where you work and how you work. The other side of personalization is the work setting. How do we build a work setting where your personal concerns are cared for? We used to call that participant management. That's a good idea. We then call that your employee value proposition. We call it diversity and building a unique setting. Now I think what we're beginning to write, we call it hybrid work. Where are you going to work? Now I think we're beginning to say your work setting is going to require the navigation of paradox. I got to be honest, Bill, when I did, I'm posting on LinkedIn every week. And when I'm trying to write in 1200 words, a complicated idea, this is one of the most difficult. Because when I, as a business leader, look at my employee, I say to them, I'm going to personalize your work. On the one hand, I'm going to care for you. I'm going to know you. I'm going to have empathy. I'm going to have concern. I'm going to show compassion. On the other hand, I'm going to tailor the work for you. What that tailoring means, and a lot of people misinterpret it, you can work wherever you want, whenever you want, however you want. No, that's not true. The reason we choose paradox is we care for you, and we as a company have to still be competitive. We're going to tailor the organization so that it meets your needs, but you then meet our needs. And so the personalization is both on the one hand, personal for the employee, and the other hand, isation, if you will, navigating the paradoxes where you work. We're going to navigate that paradox. You can work at home. You can work in the office. We're going to navigate those two. We're going to care for you, and you're going to be competitive. We're going to care about you as an individual, and we're going to build a collective organization. And navigating those paradoxes says you are not just entitled to do whatever you want, whenever you want. You've got to do whatever you want, whenever you want, and create an organization that succeeds in the marketplace. That is tricky. But that's where we see that employee experience growing. Personalization, caring for you as an individual, navigating the paradoxes that allow the organization to be successful in its marketplace. Well, I mean, there's a long history of this. <clears throat> I mean, I, I think it goes back to the role that employees play in companies. You know, if you go back maybe 100 years, employees were workers, they were labor, and they were considered to be replaceable parts. It actually goes back to slavery, as a matter of fact. And so a lot of organization structure and reward systems were designed around 
um, the replaceability of people and the evaluation and comparison of people. And the only thing we did for employee experience was make sure they didn't get hurt and that they could put in the hours, lift the weights, and do the physical effort. And then, of course, when we moved into the information economy, um, you know, we needed to train people, we needed to align people, we needed to give people tools. And so, you know, the idea of employee engagement was born probably 25, 30 years ago by companies like Gallup. <clears throat> and companies used to do annual surveys, and that was employee experience was, um, you know, literally, how did we do this year on the employee survey versus last year? And then during the last 10 years, when we got into technology, you know, disruption and digital jobs and digital enabled jobs, um, we started to look at um, much more, you know, productivity related measures, not how do people feel about their job and their, do they have a best friend at work and do they get along with their manager, but can they do their work well, what's going well, what's going poorly, um, are they interrupted by family issues at home, do they feel healthy, and so now, coming through the pandemic, we have this whole new set of issues in EX that have to do with simplicity, clarity, well-being, focus, um, mental health, physical health, um, endurance, overwork. I mean, these are things that you know actually have been around for hundreds of years, but nobody paid attention to them before because we didn't mind if somebody quit. But now we don't want people to quit because they're bringing massive amounts of intellectual property with them. <clears throat> and, you know, the longer somebody works for a company, the more valuable they become. So um, not only do we want to make them more productive on an ongoing basis, but we want to make sure we move them around from place to place so that they can grow on the job. So when you look at the way EX works today, it's much more complicated and we have tools to diagnose employee issues in, in virtually real time uh, to, to spot problems, to spot issues, and, um, and then respond to them with employee experience platforms and technologies that, um, that in managers in HR and IT people can use to facilitate work you know, f directly in the line of whatever that job may be, whether it be frontline or a white collar job. So it's a big, big area. In fact, if you think what it's done to HR, it's turned HR inside out. Now, you know, there's many ways to think about HR, and we're doing a lot of work on the future on the actual HR operating model. But a lot of companies have defined their HR mission as employee experience being their number one goal, and that's, um, you know, quite a far distance from where this started, where this was just one small issue among many others. So. And then it's going to get even more complicated because we have AI and we have better analytics and we have <clears throat> sentiment analysis and um, what is called passive listening, where systems can literally look at your video online or look at the emails you're sending and look at your calendar and say, hey, it looks like you're stressed out. Maybe you need to take a break. So it's, it's, it's a never-ending journey, but it's, it's really changed a lot. Before we hit record today, uh, you asked me a question. You, you, it was along the lines of, what, what are the, what are the key topics at the moment? What, what, what are the, what are the most popular topics that you're, you're seeing and, and influencing the downloads and such on the podcast? And um, of course, I answered uh, that one of the main ones is uh, how generative AI and large or deep language models are shaking things up in the world of work. Uh, at a at a recent Disrupt HR event, we had twelve speakers. Six or seven of those were talking about. AI and its impact on the world of work in different ways. And uh, tech is increasingly impacting the employee experience and changing the ways that HR departments are operating. How do you think generative AI and deep language models will shake up the HR function in the coming years? There's two answers. So let me give a broad answer once. Technology is always evolving. And, and, and we've seen some waves of technology that are evolving. One wave is technology allows us to do things more efficiently. We got it. All the technology enabled solutions. The second wave, technology is full of apps. You've worked with Josh Burson. He knows more apps of technology than I'd even seen. Hundreds of new apps that are po populating. The third wave of digital and technology at a broad level is information. It allows us to access information we didn't see before. And the fourth wave that we're moving towards is it allows us to have a differentiated experience. 
as technology moves through those waves from efficiency to application to information to experience, it changes the way of work. We can have experiences. I just had a nice experience with you, Bill, by seeing what's in your background, the ocean, the peace. I get to peek into people's lives through technology and find out. I have found out so many cool stories. That's a picture of your father. Tell me the story. That's a picture of your mother, your grandmother. And I get to see the experience build in a remote way. That's the broad evolution of technology from efficiency to apps, to information, to experience. Specifically with AI, think about AI as an incredible tool. I see people saying, stop AI, stop AI. And you probably don't remember this, but many years ago in the Tiananmen Square uh, crisis, there was a, an individual that's an iconic picture standing in front of the tank saying, stop the tanks from rolling. We're not gonna stop AI. It's real, it's gonna happen. What's the benefit of AI? It allows us to consolidate the past. The way AI works is it goes out into the internet and it says, what's been done in the past? It's kind of like a Google search extended and it synthesizes that in a brilliant way. I decided in November when ChatGPT came out, my children who are all uh, college professors said, dad, this is gonna change our world. So I got on, I did an exercise. What's the future of HR? Chat GPT in 20 seconds wrote a 200 word essay. I read it and I went, oh my gosh, that's incredible. That's incredible. And then I read it again. And I said, that's what people that you've interviewed on your show and I and others have written. That's what chat GPT does. That's what and neural language processing does is it goes back and processes that. It does not do two things. It does not create the future. So I wrote a 200 word essay that was what the next generation would be. I think knowing that we don't need to do literature reviews. We can do that through chat GPT, but we've got to have the creativity to go forward. The second dilemma that I've seen with AI, chat GPT and AI enabled, it doesn't have the ability to discern. I bet you've discovered, Bill, that on the internet, there are a lot of things that are not necessarily true or ethically viable. Take two seconds, you'll find them. Chat GPT doesn't have the ability to discern what's ethical and what's not. And so it synthesizes all of that in an amoral, not um, immoral, but there's no ethics about, wow, that came from a bad source. An example I love. I love it when I go on the internet and people say, I did research and I found out the skills for future HR people and I love analytics. And so I then ask them, so what was your database? I interviewed 15 people. Uh, that's not analytics, that's a focus group. And, and, and chat GPT would look at that with the same level of rigor. And I, I don't mean to spout our stuff, but we've done research with 100,000 people over 35 years. We've done analytics and chat GPT would treat those as equal and they're not. And that's where the judgment comes in. That's a long answer to your question, I'm sorry, but it's coming and it's gonna shape our world. Oh, it's going to be fascinating. It's going to be really important. Um, and the, the interpretation I have is that most of the things we do in HR, maybe 80 to 90% of them, have to do with human issues where there's no right or wrong answer. They're contextual decisions or programs or initiatives that um, have to do with language, text, human relationships, psychology, et cetera. And so, you know, if you look at training, onboarding, recruiting, writing a job requisition, giving somebody a performance appraisal, giving somebody coaching, giving somebody feedback, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Those are all interpretive jobs <clears throat> where you interpret information from a human conversation of some kind or some information you have and you, and you feed it back to this person to either help them, recruit them, train them, develop them, et cetera. Turns out the generative AI is pretty good at a lot of that. It's really good at summarizing a lot of textual information, um, interpreting it, and I don't mean in a human way, but in a mathematical way, and then um, turning it into something else. So I have seen demos already, and we're only about a month or two into this, of companies, vendors, who've built recruiting tools they can rewrite job requisitions, 
create conversations with um, candidates, con- help recruiters better spot good candidates, um, and better assess candidates using generative AI. And I think this is going to be massive, and it's going to complement all this skills work that we've been trying to do for the last couple of years to assess people's skills. By the way, what is a skill? A skill is not – a skill is a word. It's just some word that describes something you know how to do. And it might be one word or it might be a phrase. Generative AI manages tokens or words. So it's a skills assessment system, basically. So there's a lot of applications for this. In the training space, I've also seen vendors already where you can sort of look at a body of content, maybe in a course or an onboarding program or a document or a compliance process or you know some operating manual, and it can create a test, and it can create a course, and it can create an outline. You know, it takes instructional designers days and days and days to do that by hand. It, it can do it in minutes, and it won't be perfect, but it'll save a huge amount of time. And then in the third area, I think it's just in support and employee experience. You know, I, how do I take leave? How do I um, file my 401k and change the mix of benefits? On and on and on. We've had to build websites. We've had to build call centers, um, you know, all sorts of fancy tools to try to solve these hundreds and hundreds of questions that employees have. Just ask the chat GPT or, or you know, Bing, whatever it is. Ask the generative AI system the question. Let it go out and find the answer for you. I was with Workday last week, and I challenged them. They weren't exactly ready to do this. I said, look, Workday is really hard to use. People are struggling with it to try to find the right button to push to do the different things they need to do. If you had a generative AI front end that knew where all the things were in Workday, maybe you could just talk to it. And they know that's coming, so they're going to work on that. So there's, there's just a – and I'm, I'm not covering everything. There's just a lot of things here that it's going to help. And that takes us to the end of this very special episode. Thanks to the hundreds and hundreds of awesome guests who've been kind enough to offer their time to record with us over the years. Shout outs also go to our amazing guest hosts, including Pauline James, Matt Burns, Roger Thorpe and Tim Baker. And finally, a massive, gigantic amount of love and appreciation to you our hundreds of thousands of listeners for your ongoing support thanks for tuning in and as always until next time happy working thanks for listening to the hr chat show if you enjoyed this episode why not subscribe and listen to some of the hundreds of episodes published by hr gazette and remember for what's new in the world of work Subscribe to the show, follow us on social media, and visit hrgazette.com.